Hello, everybody, and welcome to Adobe Live. My name is Flynn. I'm here with the fantastic Lillian Darmono. Um, thank you, Lillian, so much for joining us. Um, we'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land in which we're streaming and creating from today and pay our respects to elders past, present, and emerging. Um, if you're watching this anywhere other than Behance, jump over to behance.net slash live if you want to join the chat. Uh, you can see Johanna, Festus, and Amanda already in there. Come and say hello. Ask us questions as we're going along. But first things first, Lillian, how are you going? Yeah, I'm good. Um, certainly uh, better than uh, you guys are doing in Sydney um, in lockdown. I, you know, um, being in Victoria, we know what that's like. So, yeah, yeah so sorry that's happening at the moment. So any, tough. Any tips for us <laughs> as experienced veterans of <laughs> lockdowns? <laughs> Uh, take it a day at a time. Don't worry about gaining weight. Lots of comfort food. Um, oh, good. Outdoor walks. Yep. Every this day, is, get some time outside. This is good. This is good advice. I'm glad it wasn't. You know, fix fix those things around the house that you've been meaning to do, or do that extra project. No. Or anything. It's all about <laughs> taking a step back and just looking after yourself, which is good. And I appreciate the food comment because yes, um, I have I have that staying at home bod um, for sure at the moment. Yep. <laughs> yep support your local business order a lot of takeaways don't cook um cakes anything nice and treatsy really oh, good this is yeah. perfect this is the this is the self-help i need mm -hmm. amanda in chat showers are important <laughs> yeah they're yeah they're important not that important if you don't leave the house for a while but yeah no you're probably right um so yeah it's um it's it's great to be here with 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 you all um so this is tuesday here in in australia and we're going to be streaming today on tuesday with lillian and also on thursday so make make sure you come back for that um but lillian art director and illustrator um i have some of your work up um that maybe we could show for those that aren't familiar with your work and maybe you could give us a bit of a the mm -hmm. elevator pitch of, of what you get up to and what makes you tick in your work. So I'll, I'll share that now. Um, but yeah, what do you, what, what's a day in the life for you? Um, usually uh, when there is client work, I get into uh, the office, the studio space. Now that we're allowed to work from studio spaces again here in Melbourne, get in and then start doing client work uh, straight away, which can be anytime from, you know, 9.30 to 10 a.m. after dropping off my little one at daycare, uh, which is going to be a, a different ball game again next year when he starts school. And then my day is typically uh, quite short, so it will end at about uh, 3.30 or 3.45, pick up the little pick one from time. daycare when it's my turn to pick up, yeah, 4 o'clock. Um, but then to make up for the time the hours that i don't do in front of the computer at the office uh, i do a little bit of work at home either on the um, ipad or on the uh, you know lap laptop i have two different syntax one at the studio one at home um, sometimes mm -hmm. i do a little bit of work in the spare room at home so you know just because it's broken up because of um, parenting commitments it doesn't mean that uh, people with kids um, do less work than people without kids. Um, so yep. yeah, uh, in terms of my work, I I am known for my character designs. So most of the time when people come to me, uh, lately it's been two things. One is characters to lend a little bit of personality and warmth to their brand. But also the other side of it is usually to interpret um, complicated abstract concepts of corporate speak into images that are relatable, like that picture that you see mm. um, in the middle of the screen there, right next to Ariel, between Ariel and Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. So that's from a recent project for a finance mortgage company in the US called Blend. And they have these 10 different core values of the company. And they're all quite abstract in a sense that they're, they're all about um, how the company treats its people and their principles. Like this one is valuing input over outcome. Uh, another one is, uh, you know, longevity and con this is continued con consumer growth. Mm. Um, so, you know, it's they, they were drawn to things that are less figurative. So they prefer everything to be abstract, but still kind of warm and exciting. And that's when I come in to interpret them, you know, the, the basically words uh, or paragraphs into an illustration that all the stakeholders can look at and the consumers can look at and feel, oh, yes, that that represents that particular value in right. uh, their corporate guidebook. So, yeah, um, quite quite different uh, ball game than making character designs. 
which yeah. typically end up in apps or animation. Right. Yeah. 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 Wow. I can still see that offset style um, that I that I saw a year ago. I think when we when when we were um, doing some cal- character illustration here on Adobe Live and um, the line work outside, mm-hmm. like kind of being being offset. So I love that it's still got that yeah. alien flavor. Um, super, yeah. Super interesting and kind of you know ex- expanded perspectives, like the way that this kind of flows in has that energy flowing towards the central focal point it's very very interesting yeah that's interesting actually that you pointed that out because um some art directors and creative directors have come to me specifically for that particular offset look mm. you know that that comes up in meetings saying that oh we really enjoy how the line work does not match the solid fill and we want a little bit of that and um they are also drawn to the expressive quality of the lines so um, those two things are something that just sort of like I really enjoy creating. So it's good, I guess, to get paid to do exactly the thing that your body wants to do. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, absolutely. Well, then, should we chat about the character? Maybe pick a character one to chat about. Um, maybe one. Of these um, ones? Maybe that one with um, yeah, a- any of those really. But the one with a lot of faces. Oh, this that's one here? that's yeah. just uh, sort of like. Yeah, that's um, an experimentation of how I can make personal art that then will translate into my paid work, um, trying to come up with a character style that is a bit more ownable. It's always a little bit of a tricky balance, I guess, when it comes to the type of work that I do, because most of the time people come to me wanting a certain character that is anonymous enough so that it doesn't call for attention to itself but rather support the brand that they want to um Mm. you know kind of the brand impression that they want customers to really get from the visual products but at the same time it's like if it's anonymous and it looks like something that can be purchased from a stock library then why would people come to me Mm. so it's always a bit of a, a tricky balance you know this is something that i i constantly talk about with the um the producers at jackie winter especially jeremy the founder um talking about because you know as as a leader of an illustration agency he really has his ear on the ground in terms of trends and what people are drawn to so i'm always asking for his advice and you know for his opinion where should i push the characters into like what sort of territory what sort of areas can i should i explore and the thing about the relationship i have uh, with them or with him is that i i have to take whatever he says with a grain of salt as well because and he he that's what that's exactly what he wants me to do because he he encourages every artist to have their own journey to have their own uh, goal in mind and you know he in ultimately he's an external person and all he does is kind of gently guide us and he doesn't he's not fully aware of everything that's going on in right. our um, personal artistic development so yeah it's 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 a very enjoyable relationship because he doesn't dictate he doesn't you know he's, right. he's not dictatorial in terms of like what I, you know he, i want you to do this and this and this but it's always good to get his opinion and feedback in terms of these things because he knows what's going on out there yeah so yeah so this is an example of me trying to come up with a, a style that is ownable when it comes to the facial features oh that's that's great that's super great to hear yeah. love jeremy wartsman and jeremy for a long time um okay cool well um i think in store for us today um because you're talking about you have a cintiq at the office I uh, have a Cintiq at home mm-hmm. as well, and you illustrate on the iPad. Yeah. Pretty much use every app. You're like, yeah. you use pretty much everything. <laughs> but today, um, today we're going to be playing around with Fresco, I think, um, which mm-hmm. we have cleverly already connected. Um, and so we're all good to go. Hooray. So we can actually see. <laughs> <laughs> it's like we planned it. Um, so obviously yeah. we can see some of your, your previous illustra- illustrations and sketches and stuff, but what do you primarily use Fresco for in your process? Um, 80% of the time it is to do personal work. So uh, like what we talked about before, I like using Fresco just to unwind at the end of the day. Mm. 
um, sitting in bed. It's still happening. I mean, last time we chatted, my son was three something, and now he's four and a half, and we still bed share. Uh, the whole family sleeps together in a in a big, uh, you know, sort of queen size bed and a single bed, all sort of tucked in together. And right. he needs the reassurance that his parents are next to him. So, when it comes to my bedtime, I like to come into the bedroom, uh, sit on my iPad, listen to a podcast or a story, or like watching uh, an old TV show on picture on picture on the iPad, mm. and um, yeah, start sketching. But typically, I would start by picking uh, a solid color for the background because um, in a dark room, the white of the paper really hurts my eyes. So this is what I would do: is I would pick a random color. Is that the only um, reason, or do you prefer to have a background to start from for other reasons? Yes, yes. Uh, well, um, yeah. I don't know. I guess. I guess. Uh, because a lot of my personal work has very strong colors, um, it sort of dictates the mood. Mm. So I tend to pick the color of the background first to sort of like set the mood of what I want the this this illustration to be like. And then for my personal work, I always use the vector brush instead of the um, the pixel brush. Right. Well, I have used the pixel brush um, now and then, but most of the time. Because it's really fluid, and I just get a lot of pleasure from drawing um, lines like this because of the consistent quality of the lines, the smoothness of it, you know. Um, and I would start with zero idea in my head of what I want to make, uh, and sometimes it takes a few different tries of what is it that I I want to draw to come up with the actual artwork so yeah and so do you just you just start drawing yep yeah with no clear idea of what i want to make at all um because <laughs> that's this so is... brave that's so brave <laughs> <laughs> to hear <laughs> and start drawing on a blank canvas it's like one of the hardest things to do i think for people yeah yeah but i, I mean this is why these these um things are created you know digital apps with the undo button like if i don't like that mm. i'll just go clear layer and it's gone yeah and i'll start again you know so there's no fear of you know leaving something there that will you know stay there forever even though you don't like it so you know you start again and you start again and you start again um i'm going to keep asking my questions but also chat if you have, yeah, go if for you it. have questions as we're going as well throw them in chat again if you're just joining us um, jump over to behance.net slash live and that's the chat that we'll be using today. Feel free to throw your questions in. Um, yeah. Um, do you find that you're quite ruthless with um, your earlier kind of sketches or do you get to a point where you attempt to try to salvage? Like how how do you find that, that process? Because you, you just deleted something that was better than <laughs> anything I've ever drawn. <laughs> <laughs> and I think I would have at um, least kept it in an archive somewhere, but you just went, no, nah, see you later. Yeah, I, I am quite ruthless because this is this is my personal time. So if I don't like something, it's like ordering um, a cake at a restaurant. You know, if you don't like something, why persist, right? right. I mean, this, this is free. The cake at the restaurant, you got to pay for. <laughs> um, so, you know, and don't waste food. And this is free. You just delete it and then but if i mean it depends like here i'm trying to create a nice shape for the hand because i've arrived at something that i think you know it's, it's worth salvaging so here i am salvaging so having saved the ruthless bit now it's the other bit of like trying to salvage um drawing drawing the right bits to yeah. make the composition work so now we're using the eraser more rather than just deleting the whole layer. Right. Or clearing the whole layer. Um, Mandarin chat says, I get so conflicted with which app to use because uh, there's so many. I wish I would just choose one. Yeah, do you have any kind mm -hmm. of, I mean, we, talk, we spoke that you pretty much use everything. Um, but yeah, how do you choose which app to use? Uh, by trying it and then I, I'm actually... I'm quite, I'm quite um, 
weak when it comes to app. Like if I don't like something, I'll just switch to something else. Yeah. Um, which was what happened with Procreate, sadly. I mean, I, I feel really bad saying this because it is an Australian um, app developed by Australian. And um, but it, it, I don't know for some reason my brain just does not click with it. Um, right. And when it came out and a lot of artists are using it, I felt a, a huge deal of FOMO. Um, and yeah. you know, I tried to use it over and over again, but for some reason, I just, I just can't, I can't get into it. So um, one day, randomly, I saw Kyle, Kyle uh, Webster, the brush maker, um, shared his early um, experimentations with Fresco, and I'm like, what is Fresco? Oh, it's uh, Adobe, and I already have a subscription, so I thought I'll give it a try, see what happens, and then. Yeah, it's sort of stuck. But, I mean, outside of this, I've also tried different things that are um, non-Adobe products for different um, purposes. And I guess th it's kind of where you really appreciate the interface design when it comes to apps and how friendly they are, mm -hmm. where the brushes are located, what happens with, um, you know, like you, you have a certain instincts as an artist. And I guess that's... Um, what the app developers are trying to work um, off and uh, yeah the, the ones that tend to gel with me are the ones where I don't really have to fight my instincts too much and kind of know you know like, okay logically this this brush would be there this tool will be mm. at a different location you know I don't know it's it's I guess it's so personal so my answer would be to just try and um, see what you like the most yeah yeah, I think that's I think that's I think that's really important. Um, it is really nice when you're using an app or you know some you know a web app or an app on your phone or something, and everything's where you think it should be, like the menu items yeah, yeah. are where it should be, and you just for whatever reason you find using it there's no friction there, and then you, sometimes you don't even realize until you know you use something else and you get really frustrated and you think why is this why are there three hamburger menus here and everything's hidden and <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah lots of times because so. even like the location of certain things where where it is in the app that you know your brain by now if you are a person that uses uh, a bunch of digital um, products your brain already associates the top right right hand corner with certain things versus the top left hand corner or the bottom left hand corner um, and when apps don't pay attention to that you just get really frustrated and yeah, so those things really matter. Absolutely. And and back to the artwork, are you using any particular brush for this? or Because it's quite flat. Um, and you mentioned you were using the vector brushes. So is it just, yeah, just kind of standard tape? Yeah, brush, it's just or? a standard basic round. Basic round, uh, yeah. There's no taper because I, I prefer the line work to not have any uh, tapering whatsoever mm. for this type of stuff that I do I mean this this is just me mucking around this is me having fun so um, obviously different different things uh, call for different sort of line quality but this is just me having fun do you ever do tapered tapered lines in 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 any of your work or, or do you prefer to have because um, I know a lot of your work is vector so you need to fill those lines you need to create those shapes to fill them in? Uh, actually, I very rarely do mm. tapered lines these days. Uh, the recent commission with The Little Mermaid, um, that was different because that was the first time I've had to use tapered vector lines to kind of be within the official Disney style guide. And uh, yeah, that was like, that was interesting because I haven't used tapered lines in a long time. And I'm like, oh, there it is. You got to use the tapered tool in Illustrator, and you're like, ah, oh, right. Uh, I remember what that's for. That's you know? so. that's a great segue because that Disney piece that you're talking about, which I think is the the most recent post on your Instagram, which we shared before. Um, Tara from chat yeah. has asked, uh, well said, loved seeing your Disney piece. May I ask which app you use to make it? So yeah, could you tell us a little bit more about that Disney piece? Yeah. So that was the sketch was done in uh, Photoshop. Uh, and then sent through for approval. And then when um, 
the Disney team has approved the composition. Uh, then I took it into Illustrator and then back out into Photoshop to add the textures and the hand-drawn lines once the all the sort of like vector shapes are completed. And the reason for that is because um, I need to create sharp, bold shapes. Um, that's part of the style, but also for for the actual character itself, Ariel and Flounder and Sebastian. Um, you know, I have to follow the the style that you know, it's part of their IP, so it has to be followed very faithfully. Mm. Um, and that dictates clean, sharp lines. Um, and so that's why I used um, Illustrator for that. But then. The fun part comes with uh, texturing and shading and uh, filling in line works in um, different parts of the composition. Yeah, wow. So many questions about yeah. this. So um, do they share the style guide with you? Like, is it publicly shared, the style guide? Is it something they share with you at the beginning? Or was it something they shared with you after? Because you mentioned there was a bit of an approval process. At what point do you get this? Yeah, guide? so... In the beginning, I was given character sheets for Ariel and Flounder and Sebastian to make sure that whatever I draw is uh, accurate in terms of proportions and stuff. Ariel has a has a um, uh, quite a small body compared to the size of her head, so that's what I had to make sure I, I keep that um, accurate. And then um, during sketch process, going back and forth with Disney. The art direction team actually drew over what I've done to make sure that it's accurate and I just follow that. So that makes it really easy for me um, in terms of how Ariel is supposed to look as a side profile. Um, and uh, Flounder, how many stripes he has and uh, which way he's, he's sort of like his fin and you know the bit um, on top of his head that looks like his hair. How that flops forward and stuff. So Right. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's that's super cool. Um, so uh, there's also a question: Can you customize the vector brushes yet, like in Illustrator? So I assume, Amanda, you mean in in Fresco. Um, I don't think you can import brushes yet, but I know there's a big brushes um, update coming um, before Adobe Max, which is in October. So. Um, I imagine right. if you can't do it now, that there'll be a big update to brushes coming uh, for Fresco and also probably um, iPad. Um, iPad. I mean, you I can import um, you can import Kyle's brushes as you can see there. Mm. I've imported Kyle's brushes into the into the Pixel Brush library, but I because I personally I don't uh, muck around with the vector brushes that's available so i i don't know i can't answer that question um but yeah that's an interesting one yeah and um johanna's asked in chat do you often take on commissions is this something you'd like to do more uh i i don't i never do um there's no time between <laughs> parenting and doing client work yeah uh, exercise and yeah, all the other life stuff. There's just simply no time. All the other things that we're meant to do every day. Um. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. It's very different um, life with a kid. Um, yeah. Absolutely. Um, and then there was also um, yeah, just on the, the the Disney process. You mentioned someone drawing over your work. Um, Johanna said, asked, mm -hmm. what, what was that like? Uh, it was great because, <laughs> because it, it's, it's not my IP, it's right. their IP. So the character artists and the art directors at Disney know exactly where Ariel's eyebrow needs to be, right. what her profile needs to be, how big her chin is. And if I'm not correct in that, then, um, it's easier for them to draw over it rather than saying move in words, you know, move it this way a bit or right. bring it two pixels forward or in, de decrease it by 20%. You know, you'd be like, just, just, just draw over the thing. <laughs> yeah. So it made it really Makes easy sense. for me and I'm it happened because yeah. yeah. 
it's not my IP, so it, it felt great. Nice. Um, and we were chatting a little bit earlier about this kind of offset style. It's not something you're demonstrating at the moment, um, but kind of the, the style where the shapes and the outline will kind of be all offset. Um, and there was a question around that that oh, I missed. Oh, I was just about to do that. <laughs> oh, okay, okay, perfect. Um, it, it's a question from chat. Is this is that offset style something you've used for a long while or is it more recent? Um, I would say I started doing it maybe two and a half years ago, mm -hmm. two and a half or three years ago. Yeah, um, it's dictated by what's in the market. So because part of my um, income stream is being a style frame artist or a designer for uh, animated explainers. Um, so that line of work, it really requires you to not use your own style, but rather follow the style that your client, the animation studio has requested you to mimic based on, um, you know, mood boards that their client provide. Mm. Typically advertising agencies would be like, oh, we want this kind of look mixed with that kind of look. So it was just by coincidence that um, in 2018, I think, um, yeah, in 2018, or was it 2019, Time just loses all meaning in, in, um, <laughs> in COVID world. Somebody came to me with that request. So um, that's kind of like when it started happening. That I started experimenting with that offset look. Um, and, you know, as long as the demand keeps pouring in, I'll keep making it. And it's not something that I personally dislike. So there's no conflict there. Right. Yeah. Very cool. And just a reminder, um, you can ask questions um, in the chat. So if you want to throw them in, um, please do. Um, what is time? I think is a question from chat. I assume that's rhetorical, but yeah. Um, what is time these days? <laughs> the construct. <laughs> it's a construct. Yeah. It's a construct. And how do you find balancing personal projects with with your client work? I mean, you mentioned that it's something you tend to do in the evening, but do you ever find that you do, you, f you feel, oh, I've done a little bit too much personal work, I really need to focus more on the client work at the moment or vice versa? Yeah, um, I just kind of listen to my body a little bit. Um, the hand wants to do what it does, you know. Uh, usually it's the other way around. If I've been really busy because uh, most of my personal work and client work are digital because of lack of time. You know, ideally, I would like to have a big um, artist studio where I can create huge, huge canvases, but that's not possible. Mm. Um, but, you know, if I've been doing a lot of digital stuff, my body would crave the touch of paper and paint, and then I would try and set aside some time. Uh, next time there's a break between schedules, between things, then I would paint something either in watercolor or acrylic just to have fun. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Uh, we've got a question, a lot of questions about style mm -hmm. and stuff here. So if you're happy for me to keep, keep going along. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah. So Johanna's asked a great question. When it comes to getting style direction tips based on what's in the market, how do you maintain your mm -hmm. own style against that? Or is it something you completely let go of? Uh, I let go of my own personal style because in the end, that's why I get paid. Yeah. Um, because I'm the style doctor. I'm style getting paid <laughs> to solve people's... Yeah, I'm getting paid to solve people's problems, mm. not to impose my own personal um, agenda mm. on the output. There's always time and place for everything, you know. Um, usually in my work, the only time I I, I, I kind of battle, you know, like fight against what the client wants is when they push for something that I know does not, ultimately does not meet their communication objective. Right. Like by having too many colors or too few colors or, you know, occasionally they say, please don't put a person with a hijabi, a, a hijabi in this 
composition, they'll be like, oh, blah, blah, diversity. You get it, like, you, you know, like sometimes people just get really uncomfortable about inclusion of um, minority groups. Mm. And that's when I, I try and fight against that. But when it comes to style, it's just, yeah, they pay me to make something work based on their um, mood boards. And that's what I do. Yep, that's great. And obviously you have you have your own personal work to, to push, you know, experiment and play and, and kind of experiment, yeah, experiment with new styles and put a lot of that work out. And you've mentioned before that that personal work has like led to client work anyway, right? So it's kind of... Yeah. Cool. Also, I feel like the other thing that people don't talk about a lot is um, the fact that once... I think as artists, you you get told that keep making personal art and someday somebody will like it enough and pay you for it. Mm. We don't get warned that when that happens, a little bit of that pleasure of making personal work disappears. Right. So like if you do a style really well and people come to you for that style, you'll end up making quite decent money for maybe years at a time. That's fine. That's great. You know, you pay your bills or whatnot. But as as long as somebody else her, holds the purse string, you will never be 100% satisfied. And that's what something that, I, it's, it's something that I've learned um, over time. Now that I'm older, I realize that that's, that's actually what's happening. Mm. So once your style becomes popular and people come to you for it and you end up making money, you know, hand over fist or, or whatever, you know, you end up getting paid okay for it and you, you will itch for something else. So then that's how you um, experiment for more things and, and try and invent the next thing. Yeah. So that's great. People don't talk about that, but that's, that's actually what happens. Yeah, that's an interest. That's an interesting one because we often talk. We often, um, you know, particularly I think with illustration and a little bit, a little bit with design, people talk about, you know, creating the work that you, you know, you want to be approached for. Um, but it it does sound like that it's a bit of a double edged sword some of the time as well. Um, it does absolutely. So I've got some more questions. Thanks for the questions, everybody. So feel free to throw them in and we'll get to, we'll get to them all as, as we can as well. And we're also back on Thursday um, with Lillian. So if we, for whatever reason, um, miss out, we'll, we'll roll the questions over and we can always ask them as we're going along. Because I know we're throwing a, lot of, uh, throwing a lot of questions, big questions at you, Lillian, but you're answering so well. Um, <laughs> that they're going to they're gonna keep coming. Tara in chat saying she's dropping facts. Um, yeah, exactly. Um, so thank you, thank you for your candidness and, and answering all these questions. No worries. Um, so there was here's a bit of a here's a bit of a broader one. So um, mm -hmm. any tips for new graduates looking to find similar work? Um, oh, that's a hard one. Um, I guess Easy to ask, hard to answer. if you are, a, <laughs> yeah, if you're a fresh graduate, I think one thing that is really important to, to learn is how to work well in a professional environment with other people. So that's really important. So my tip would be if possible, um, a full-time job or like a, a staff employment where you get to be with other designers and artists is valuable, um, because it will be an important basis for you to, you know, to forge your own freelance career someday down the track, if that's what you want to do. Mm. Um, a lot of what I know, like things that clients come to me for, I would like to think, you know, it's my, my professionalism, my work ethic, whatnot, yada, yada, blah, blah. You can't learn that in school. You have to learn that on the job and that's really valuable. But also at the same time, you got to make sure that the first full-time job that you take up is with good people that appreciate you. Because when you come out from school, you're very young and you're very tender and you need to be with people that teaches you how to value yourself. And I was lucky enough that that's what happened to me because that gave me the basis of um, 
you know, having the confidence to argue for a pay rise in my second full-time job, mm. having the confidence to to say no to being asked to do overtime unpaid because I know how to prioritize my health uh, and so on and so forth. So that's really, really important. And, um, you know, while you have your full-time job, you know, you, you don't have to worry about paying um, bills or paying your hex or a student loan or whatnot. Do art, do your own personal art on the side because no matter where you are in your career, that, that will never stop, I think, if you're serious about your craft. Even when you're old, you know, you would always be doing your personal art on the side. Um, and I think having that separation between how you make money and how you feed your artistic soul is really healthy. Uh, like I said before, like once somebody else is paying the bills, it doesn't quite satisfy as much. Um, but yeah, you know, and, and just be patient, take time and look after yourself and your health is really important. So I would say that fresh graduates should not try and burn the midnight oil and, and have a good balance between um, life and health and, and work. Um, and then time will pass. Uh, stay, you know, stay in contact with your colleagues, uh, be a decent person, be a good person, and then eventually, you know, things will work out if you keep, if you keep working hard and, you know, keep asking for opportunities and, uh, yeah. That's some, that's some great but advice. Fresh graduates, there, sure. where you end up is really important. You've got to make sure you're with the good people that look after you. Yeah, I actually remember that from the first job that I got out as a graphic designer, um, and it was it was just an internship yeah. that ended up leading to some full time work. But um, when I ended up leaving there, they said make sure you work somewhere really good at the beginning. It's kind of he he was a soccer fan, so he he compared it to like working for the best. You know, try to play with the best soccer team because then you'll always it'll raise you above. Um, and I think mm -hmm. um, I didn't end up <laughs> getting that, but I think it was good advice. Yeah, I mean, um, I think there are a lot of big name studios or big name companies that sort of um, throw their weight around a little bit and they don't necessarily treat their employees, especially the young ones, the fresh graduates, mm. um, nicely. So you got to watch out for that. Um, you know, don't, don't go after fame and reputation. Uh, like, by all means, if you need to, you say, oh, if you work for this this big name company, um, you know, it's going to be really great for your resume. Sure, um, go in fully aware that that's what you're doing it for, but also kind of know where your limits are and mm. make sure you always maintain a decent amount of self-respect and, you know, self-care. And if they don't treat you well, just leave. Yeah. You know, um, it's it's really important because, yeah, I'm, I'm not saying don't don't do it. Don't go in for the big companies, but don't sacrifice everything else for the sake of uh, a famous name on your resume. Never right. do that. Great advice. Yeah. Lots of people in chat sort of saying thanks for the advice and great advice in there. I completely agree. Um, Jumping, I'm trying to pick and choose my questions here. Um, so I, actually, before I do that, I'll let you know, we've got about 15 minutes left. It goes quick, <laughs> doesn't it? Um, so yep. Check in with the artwork. This is incredible, by the way. I just haven't acknowledged the artwork in, in about 10 minutes, but I'm sure, chat, you'll agree with me. Oh. This is like absolutely beautiful. I've got to ask about your colours because you're just colour picking, but it's all yeah. it's got so much harmony to it. So do you have, like, in your head, go-to colours that you, that you go to or...? Because if I did this, it um, would not look this this good. So what's what's the secret here? Uh, well, I've been doing this for a long time. So like the color wheel and color theory is sort of like at my fingertips. Mm. Uh, again, it starts with the dominant color in the background, which is the blue. And, um, you know, everything else is uh, a riff of that. Right. So if I want to create richness then I will choose colors that are uh, nearby shades of blue on the color wheel and if I want to create things that pop out like this yellow for instance or highlights for the hair then you go for the opposite which is you know the warm colors the the pinks uh, the yellows 
um, direct complement of blue is orange, and I don't want it to be that complementary. Mm. So I'm I'm steer I'm steering clear from orange, and I'm going just with the yellows and the pinks. Great. Um, another question that, that popped up um, from Amanda. So how do you how do you find work? Um, sorry, I'll start again. How do you find work designing for animations? Do people mostly approach you, or do you work with an agency or similar? Um, I've been in the animation game for a long time, so it's mostly word of mouth um, mm. and a network that was built over time. But usually, when things dry up, um, I would send out cold emails to studios saying, "Hi, my name is so and so." Keeping it short, sweet, and polite. Uh, this is some of my work. So just just be really clear so that the producer or whoever it is that is in charge of placing talent can immediately get within the first, you know, three lines what you do and how they are best, uh, how would be the best thing to place you within their workflow, within their team. Right. So, hi, my name is so-and-so. I'm based in Melbourne. I primarily do character design for animation. Uh, here's my folio. Uh, I have availability at the moment, reaching out to see if you have any anything um, that I can help out with. Mm. Um, so yeah, so I have done that sort of cold email thing for years and years and years. And then, yeah, from there you build uh, a good network of studios that you usually work for. Um, and yeah, these days um, I'm just relying on, on that and word of mouth. Mm. Yeah. But every, every time there's a quiet period, I would always try and reach out for new places. And I still do that now. So yeah, yeah you, you don't rest on your laurels because studios get out of, you know, go out of business. They come and go, and out don't of business they? All the time. Yeah. yeah, they come and go a fair bit in this mm. game. So yeah. Yeah. And do you ever find, do you ever find that, you know, they'll just, you need to say no quite a lot, particularly to clients that you may have worked with and had a great working relationship over the years um, and you just you just flat out it's too much on um, and you kind of have to say thank you but no thank you this this time and, and does that cause any conflict no uh, doesn't uh, I I mean I, I tend not to work with assholes you know <laughs> like I've that's a good I've that's blacklisted a good... <laughs> <laughs> I don't work with assholes why you know life is too short right um yeah. i have i have blacklisted a couple of people over the years you know not major i mean maybe two studios in the last 10 years that's not that's not a lot mm. um and i don't want to work with them again either because they're very late with their payment or they don't treat me well or they're i don't know they just don't understand that people don't live and die for their project um mm. So whenever I say no, it's it's usually you know people understand. Um, sometimes with with like the most stressful situation is like you say yes and then they there's there's some kind of uh, schedule uh, change at their end and then you can no longer say yes or like other things come in. They say they want to pencil you in, but then other things come in that are already confirmed. No. So not just like a pencil. I would always try and be frank and be open and honest as early as possible and say, okay, look, uh, I, I, I always try and not overcommit. I would say, can you let me know what is exactly the requirement for this project so I can see whether I can balance it with other things that are going on mm. um, for me. Uh, and usually producers appreciate that. Um, well, I hope so anyway. Uh, but yeah, I, I never have any sort of like... Um, there's never any sort of bad feelings every time I turn something down. But I, I try with really good friends, like studios that have become my friends, like a frequent mm. collaborator here in Melbourne, Dirty Puppet. Um, the the um, owner's name is Cameron. Cameron and I are, are practically friends. And every time he comes to me for something, I try not to say no. Yeah. So, yeah. But it depends. You know, once you, once you have that sort of level of relationship, then it's... It's really open. Everything is upfront. You say, okay, I've got this, 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 this. Um, what can I do? Um, and even if I can't take on the whole thing, I would say, do you have another artist that you um, you have on the side just in case I can't do everything you need? Mm. And you know, usually when when you're being when you be upfront with people, they appreciate it and they will try and make it work. So 
there's no yeah no hard feelings no worries mm. and a lot of that sounds like coming down to like good communication skills um some yeah, of the things that you've yeah. mentioned like you know obviously when you're fresh into an industry like understanding the the vernacular and your role and i guess other people's role um you're talking before about that email and it sounds like as someone who writes a lot of emails it sounds like a very carefully crafted email like keep it short you're sending it to a producer so keep it really short tell them who you yeah. are what you do when your availability yeah. is don't make them read too much because yeah. then they might not read it at all like all these sorts of things are yeah. very like they call them soft skills but they they're so important um so important yeah. so so important yeah um so a little bit less than 10 minutes left just to let you know um and so if there's mm -hmm. any more questions throw them in and just a reminder that we are back in two days so here in australia it's going to be thursday um, same time so exactly the same time we did the stream today which is 12 o'clock um, for those of you in the us um happy public holiday i don't know what holiday it is but i know it's a public holiday over there fourth of july oh, fourth of july it's their independence oh my yeah. gosh oh my gosh <laughs> should just turn the stream off now <laughs> Some, somewhat important holiday I know for y'all um yeah i know this because i have a lot of american friends and they work so hard all year and then when it comes to fourth of july it's like uh, their rare opportunity to have um, uh, an extended break so right yeah i appreciate them not being online at all so a, a quick note uh, the reason why i'm switching to a blank canvas is because we're going to be back on thursday with another live stream so i just want to share a little bit of um how i typically do uh, another workflow pretending this is client work and they have requested for a character design of someone who is um, standing around having coffee um, and looking at their phone. And I'm making the canvas 1920 1080, which is a standard HD size for motion design, um, because most of the time that's what my work ends up being. So I'm choosing a brush this time, and it's just a pencil. So we're still in fresco, but so because um, this is client, and this we're still is, in fresco. Yeah, but you're using a pixel brush this time. So for those of you oh, who have missed the beginning, I'm um, using really a pixel drawing brush. everything in in vector. Yeah. But yeah, now now sketching in pixel. Yeah. And because this is client work, usually it is a style that um, I am not experimenting for. Like I already I already know the style. I already know what I'm going to draw. Um, yeah, happy 4th of July, everybody. Sorry for forgetting such an important Happy 4th day. of July, everybody. Um, Hope you're all enjoying COVID normal and the warm weather. Absolutely. And um, I had two more questions here. Maybe we can get to we'll try one if you're up for it, Lillian. Um, yep, go for it. Who or what do you look for for your own creative inspiration and influence? Um, I have a few favorite artists. Uh, one of them is Victor Ngai. Um, she creates really beautiful, rich, layered um, work. Um, another one is a classic, Max, Max Ernst. Um, I'm primarily drawn to them, Victor, because like her work is just really beautiful. But Max... And not only his work is beautiful, but also because um, as an artist, you look at his work, one decade is different from the next. And he's right. always experimenting and he's always doing things, trying different things, you know, whether it's uh, rubbings or collage or um, sculpture. So he's always trying different things. And, and I really like that. And it's a good reminder for me of what is important in my um, own creative practice to mm. do that yeah so that's the person um, wow that was quick <laughs> so you have that idea in your head already like this kind of pose yeah separate to yeah. before when you when um, you're just blank canvassing and 
just drawing and seeing what happens. So it's quite. I don't a different have approach. any any idea of, of what. Very different approach, and this is now Illustrator. On the iPad. And then I can. So sometimes when I'm really short on time, this is what I do is I sketch it on Fresco and then I bring it into Illustrator. And then I block in the color. Right. And so, and you're just using the pencil tool for that. Correct. Yeah. I think for those looking for the links to um, who Lillian mentioned, um, Victo and, and Max, Johanna's very kindly dug those up and found some links for us. So um, something for us to check out. This is um, because, I mean, Illustrator on the iPad is relatively new. You, so you can see what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to bring this object up to the front stack and that doesn't work. So it's one of those things that are still buggy within the app. So not to worry, I'll just keep going. It doesn't matter what's front or back and I can always fix it on the desktop, which is what we will do on Thursday. Cool. Amanda's asking, um, was that copy paste from Fresco to Illustrator or did you save the image and then bring it in? I saved the image and then brought it in here. Yeah. As we near the end of our time today, I just want to thank everybody in chat for the great questions um, and comments and everything. You guys have been on fire today. It's nice to hang out with you all. <laughs> just reading through some of the comments now. Um, catching up because there's been quite a few. So you can see I'm just roughly color blocking it and then tidying up the objects and then making sure they're in the right stack and stuff will come mm. on the desktop version. Just the fastest way to do this. Sometimes when I'm really short on time, this is what I have to do. Because this I can do um, sitting around in uh, the kid Yeah. at that time. Did we mention that I still bed share with my four and a half year old? You did. <laughs> <laughs> Does he ever go to grab your iPad? That's that's my thing with my kids. She just she just wants to touch whatever I have. So if I have my phone or my iPad sitting on my lap, she oh, yeah. she wants it. Yeah. Oh well, he he would be asleep. So I can only do this when he's asleep. Only when he's asleep. Okay. <laughs> yeah, but he he yeah, but he does. He'll be like, uh, "Can you show me Superman flying on your iPad?" <laughs> I'm like, no, no. Give that back to me. Nope, that's for my work. Nope, he would he would try and play with this. He he think that this this makes a great plane, and he wants to throw it across the room. I'm oh, like, no. nope. That's an expensive. Yeah. Drop that. Play. Yeah. Nope. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's an expensive plane. Um, we yeah. may need to leave After it here. We've got to about shouting. we've got about a minute left until the the stream will cut us off. So we might need to leave it here, or, or we'll we won't be able to have enough time to say our goodbyes. Um, but from from cool. here, from this stage, because um, on Thursday we'll just be in the desktop version, so um, you'll show us bringing this into yeah. Illustrator on the desktop and then your process from there, which is going to be great. Mm -hmm. That's cool. fantastic. Um, once again, right. thank you, everybody in chat. You've been great. Thank you for all the fantastic questions. It's been lovely to hang out with you. And Lillian, of course, thank you so much for coming on. There were uh, a lot of truth bombs um, getting dropped, a lot of fantastic advice I totally agree with. 
Um, and thank you so much for sharing your experience with everyone in chat. I'm sure everyone appreciated it. So thank you. And uh, have a good day. Thank you. And we'll see you on Thursday. Bye everyone. See ya. Bye.